It says the webinar streaming. Could it be? Are we live this time? Can people hear I us? believe we are L-I-V-E. Yes, I see your face. I see the Zoom logo. I see that we have arrived. Big question is, can anyone hear me? And I don't think anyone's watching just yet, so. We'll do a little vamping. Now four people are watching. Now, <laughs> people, can you hear me this time? Can you hear? I can oh. see and hear. Yay! Yay! Okay. Oh my gosh, that. I have no idea what happened there outside of, uh, you know, beautifully set up everything was where it needed to be and suddenly you were backwards and uh you you know no audio was coming out but here we are it's thursday as i said in a little write-up if at first or third or tenth you don't succeed just keep going until <laughs> owen gets sleepier and sleepier hi owen hi troy how you doing oh you know i'm not doing too bad i was doing better but uh but you know, the show must go on. Oh, the show is going on. It's just that no one can hear it. That is true. That, yeah, I, it was a show of sorts. It was a show for one. It was just for you. It was just for me. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, I want to thank everyone for your patience. Um, literally no clue what happened there, but you know, that's what you get when you um, sign up for, you know, this fun. You just never know. Um, so I, I did carefully when advertising to say it might be a train wreck, right? That was that was on my list of possibilities. That's true. Fun to watch, though. Yeah. Fun Just to watch. Fun we to didn't say, be, yeah, not fun to listen to. Um, I will say that uh, I have literally not touched this uh, setup. Um, Nicholas, good to see you. I want to say hey to Jason. I want to say hi to Sean. Um, looks the the gang's all here. Thank you all for being patient. Um, the suggestion has been made that the Cyberpunk 2077 install messed up your system. I'm just saying, is there some kind of like uh, uh, you know surveillance software installed? Because that's exactly what happened. Now. I mean, it's a Cyberpunk game, so it sort of seems like that would be on 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 brand. That is true. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I have. Do you want to kick this off in a certain way? Where are you at? How you know? Talk to me about what's going on in the world of Owen Casey Stevens. Uh, well, I mean, I've been telling people fairly regularly that on a scale from one to pandemic, I'm doing okay. Um, you know, as a freelancer, I'm working from home anyway, so that that really doesn't impact me. The one thing is that while I am a, a socially awkward, depressive introvert. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't ever want to leave the house. It just means I don't want to leave the right. house except to hang out with people I really like. So the fact that there are people I really like that I can't spend any time with, like, I mean, I moved back to my hometown. My mother lives here. I can't give her a hug. I can't go see her. That's she's not in my social bubble. Um, so yeah, there are highs and there are lows. Uh, but yeah, Thursday is always a high, right? I mean, I, I enjoy getting an opportunity to talk to people. This is like hanging out it's virtually hanging out it's as close to hanging out as i tend to get with with except for a small core group of people uh, this is what i have these days so yeah and i and i enjoy it as well it is definitely one of those um unusual but familiar sort of feelings and yeah. uh I, I appreciate everyone coming and hanging out uh as well and uh we have got I, we can't really give away too much uh but i want to let folks know there's some big plans afoot kind of bubbling around in the background and and owen i think that they deal with you on like i'm thinking of all the big things i've got cooking i there you know it's it's not a secret uh, at the beginning of the year chris prima said we're working on a fantasy age rule book uh he hadn't given a lot of details on it but that that is the thing that takes most of my waking hours now that or uh watching very gentle British competition shows. Those those are the two oh. things I normally do when I'm awake. So like um, the Great British Compliment Off. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were watching the Great British Bake Off, but we've seen all of the, the seasons we can get a hold of. But on uh, HBO Max, which our, our housemate has, we discovered that there's the Great Pottery Throwdown, which is the Great British Bake Off, but for pottery. 
Uh, oh. and my wife has an art degree and she's done pottery. So she's just fascinated by it. It's, it's, it has proved a wonderful replacement. In fact, in some ways it is better than the Great British Bake Off because watching it doesn't make me hungry. Ah, right. Yeah, it does. And they are pretty charming. Uh, do you, you're a Mary Berry advocate, I'm presuming? Yeah, I mean, actually, I've I've enjoyed all of the the hosts and judges on uh, Great British Bake Off. So even though when they changed, uh, I was like, no, it's perfect. You can't change anything. But the chemistry was still there with the new teams. So uh, they've changed a couple times now. So I, I I actually appreciate it. And I've gotten used to it just with British, you know, entertainment in general. They just kill everybody off every season like in every show i ever love uh, i'm just you know so it's sort of like game of thrones uh in that way i mean there's there's a a joke from uh the good place where someone was talking about uh, a great british television series and she was like you've never heard of it it was on for six years they had eight episodes <laughs> right. that's right i love it i do love the way that they they handle their seasons and the like um jason uh riffle says uh that his dad's a potter. Yeah. That is awesome. Um, yeah, and so I'm gonna have to check it out too, but you know, Throwdown does sound a little, um, a little uh, aggressive. Aggressive? From what I would expect, you know, from, from such a, from, you know, from British TV. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not like British colonialism didn't happen. So British and aggressive are, are not mutually exclusive. That is so true, both passive and aggressive, aggressive. Um, so uh, talk to me also, uh, so when you say uh, taking all your waking uh, days and hours and nights and, and you're up all the time, because you were what, three hours ahead of me? Uh, so I'm in Central, uh, so I'm two you're hours. Central, two. Yeah. two hours ahead. So I will see you uh, messaging within our little Slack and hours where you should be in bed. So you're uh, well, busy I mean, sort of... Uh, first of all, with, with the advent of smartphones, I can perfectly well do that and be in bed. Although, honestly, I, I don't because that's bad sleep hygiene. Um, so I'm a, I'm a diagnosed uh, insomniac. Um, I fall in that category of people with insomnia where there is no uh, discoverable or treatable root cause. So uh, and when I mention it, people will whip out their their favorite remedies. You know, have you had a sleep study? Yes. Do you have a CPAP? Yes. Uh, have you tried St. John's wort or uh, melatonin? Yes. Uh, do you engage in good sleep hygiene, which is the conditions under which you sleep? So, for example, I don't have a TV in my bedroom. Uh, I don't I don't use the bedroom for crafting or or as my office. It, it's it's specifically designed as a, a bedroom environment. Um, and sometimes I just can't sleep. Uh, I believe my record for hours awake is close to 90. Um, although having done some research- 90 hours awake? Yeah. Uh, although having done some research, when you're awake for 90 hours, you're not really awake for 90 hours because you'll start to get micro sleep, which means that your body is so exhausted that you will close your eyes and sleep for 30 seconds and not notice it. Uh, and 90 hours is, like I said, that's that's my extreme example. It is rare for me to be awake for more than 20 to 22 hours in a row. But what does happen fairly often uh, is I will go to bed and I'll sleep for three hours and I will wake up, bolt awake and exhausted. Yeah, and that's how I sleep. Nothing will put me back to sleep at that point. Uh, so since I'm a freelancer, I have to use that time to, to write and design and send messages. So uh, when I was working at Paizo for five years, one of the biggest challenges for me was trying to stick to a schedule. Um, because as a freelancer, mostly, as long as I'm available for streams and stuff, no one cares if most of the work gets done between uh, 3 a.m. And, and 8 a.m. and then I go to bed. Uh, but uh, when you're in an office, they quite reasonably want you to be there during office hours, or at least some office hours. and. They, they take it more poorly if you take a nap in the middle of the day, unless you go home to do it. So uh, I spent many years adjusting to an office schedule, and then uh, I left Paizo, and I have now been trying to adjust to a not office schedule, which turns out to be just as tricky. I think Apparently, I had actually kind of gotten used to going into the office, and now I'm not going anywhere, so. Yeah, it just sort of turned the whole thing on its ear, doesn't it? Um, yeah. uh, for, for sure. You know, when you're in your... Uh, 
creative, you know, let's say all the stars have aligned, you have done as much of the sleep or you, you know, you've done the sleep dance as you, as you needed to, uh, you've, you, uh, are you a tea drinker or coffee drinker? Uh, I actually both. Okay. Um, so you have a, you have a tea and you have a coffee and then you have like a soda and then like a charcuterie kind of uh-huh. tray and some delicious like cheeses and meats and things. And the internet is working fabulously and cheese right got, there. That's, there you go. Um, no, no Ronan is complete without some cheese. True that actually true that, you know, uh, Nicole brought, uh, you sent us all cheese for our uh, summit, that was very nice. But imagine it was just the perfect, all the stars of the line, maybe you're, I don't know, I see you sitting in a bubble bath and you've got your little shower cap on. What time of the day is your most favorite or most creative or most effective? Does it kind of vacillate or do you focus on it? Um, it, it does vacillate. Uh, I honestly probably alternate between getting the most work done between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. Um, which is when there tend to be fewer distractions. Mm-hmm. Uh, there aren't, you know, there aren't new television shows come out. News is not mostly coming out. Uh, if if I post something, people don't immediately comment on it. Um, and just I I am I am sharpest during those hours often. Um, alternatively, uh, if I'm managing to be on a schedule where I am waking up like any time before noon, if I'm if I'm successfully sleeping like one a.m. to ten a.m. or something. Uh, then from roughly an hour after I wake up till about three hours after that uh, will be my sharpest time because I will be at my most alert. Um, and I've got, I have medically induced fatigue issues and hormonal issues and, and all sorts of problems. So towards the end of my work day, whenever that starts, uh, I will frequently get pretty punchy um, and I'm depressive. So depression will frequently settle in. Uh, and, you know, you can wake up depressed. It totally happens. But if I don't I've got a window of opportunity uh, before depression makes life more difficult. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, we are uh, it's, today's show is just a little on the on the I would say on the darker side, as you know, I, I, as I said in chat, it's daymares with Owen, and you know, is hanging out in the dungeon, and um, you know, that's how we do it. Hey, Jason Wallman says hi. Hey, Jason. Hey, Owen. Um, so I've got something. Uh, you know, I want to start a new thing. Yep called hey owen stat this yep i'm looking forward to it you want me to you want me to show you you want me to you want to see it yeah well let's explain it real quick uh for the nine people still watching at the moment although i'm sure millions will watch it uh, the video later um, yeah so uh troy has a image which he will be sharing with me which i have not seen before i know nothing about it uh and i will try to tell you how to generate uh, fantasy age stats for this thing, whatever it is. And I, I would say creature, but for all I know, it's going to be a, a flaming pit trap with a pendulum in it. Right. So whatever yeah. it is, uh, I will, I will attempt to work out how to put it in your game. So that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, yeah. Troy set this up. He's done all the hard work up to this moment. Um, and, and now it's my turn. So yeah, yeah to, to varying degrees of success. Now to sort of preface all of this, um, my, uh, my hope here was to have some fun and yeah. to, uh, you know, just to be a little, uh, you know, maybe a little goofy, maybe a little irreverent, but 100%, one of the things that impresses me is your ability to take any ridiculousness that I throw at you and turn it into gold. I mean, it, by my proximity to you alone, uh, it's pretty darned impressive. And so uh, let's see here. I've got it queued up and I want to just sort of say, I mean, for the record, I didn't start out, I don't know what this is. I, it just sort of came out of me and I, uh, I so it is a baby of mine so, of sorts. It is um, so. Th- I'll leave it at that. Are you are you ready for this? I am prepared. Hey Owen, stat this. Okay, and I don't see anything. You don't see anything at all. Nope, just just me, my face. Do 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 do. I wonder if it's because it's too... Oh, there it is. There it is. It's too big. Wow. Okay. Uh, so, But I don't think it's showing up in the stream. 
it should be. And so I the don't. share screen is showing up on my zip. There it is. Now it's on the stream. Okay. Yeah. All right. It takes it takes a minute. Uh, and Jason says the cloak transforming iron golem to dragon golem. Um, okay. So uh, let's let's discuss this thing that we've got here that I'm I'm supposed to stat. Uh, first of all, you have what is pretty clearly a rock, and and that is potentially going to be important later with some some vegetation around it. Mm -hmm. uh, to the left of our rock, uh, we have what is obviously some sort of mechanical critter, and I will say mechanical because it's got lens flare on its one big round eye. <laughs> Crystal says, Troy is not allowed near Photoshop anymore. Yeah, this is, <laughs> clearly, this is pretty clearly nightmare fuel. Um, there's a big tendril coming off the, the one-eyed mechanical spider. Uh, and at the end of the tendril, there is what I would describe as a horrific parody of a human flesh bag. Nice, um, yes. <laughs> In, in the in the vein of the Egger suit from the original Men in Black movie. That's uh, right, yes. So uh, what we have here is a, a horrific mechanical creature that is trying to lure people close to it with something that is a, a mimic of a humanoid form and not a great one either. Um, so uh, when you're doing stats for Fantasy Age, there are a couple of things you'd... Crystal says she can't unsee it. Um, <laughs> there are a couple of things you need to think about. And one of the first one is, uh, is what threat level are you shooting for with this? Um, and this one's really interesting because I could easily see this being the sort of thing that people have to deal with uh, as low-level adventurers. But I could also see this as a really nasty surprise and ambush for higher-level people. Um, that said, the the really disturbing, uh, not particularly convincing nature of the flesh bag smiley face meat puppet um, is going to convince me that we should make this a moderate threat. I, I don't want it to be a minor threat. I want this to be something that you don't deal with at first or second level, just because, yes, Jason Sundry says, some sort of weird jack in the box, absolutely. Um, I want this to be a thing that, that the poor player characters have a few normal adventures under their belt before they have to deal with this monstrosity. So um, when I'm standing up a new creature, I frequently want to uh, do as little work as possible, right? I'm lazy. I'm, I'm very, very lazy. I don't want to do any more work than I have to. So that makes me want to look at existing creatures uh, and see what is out there that I could potentially reskin to serve this purpose. So right. I've got a bestiary, and I really had meant to have a uh, actual Oops, physical. Sorry. What? Oh, you no! Know, I apologize to the stream. I'm I'm trying to make this a little bigger so you can see it. Okay. Uh, I had meant to have a physical bestiary book that I could flip through, uh, just so it would be visually more interesting. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, I've been working on PDFs with multiple monitors so much recently that I don't even know where my physical bestiary is right now. Uh, so I will simply right. have to, to trust me. I got a PDF open. I'm looking through it right now. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things that you could grab uh, if you wanted weird abilities, right? So we've got genies and demons, and I, I actually could see making that a demon. That, that would not be... Uh, that would not be a tough uh, sell, but I really like the idea of this being something more mechanical. So uh, I am sitting in uh, elementals um, just because the elementals uh, are moderate threats uh, and they are you know, made of stuff. So if I look at the earth elemental, uh, which I should have right here, da, 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 elemental lords, uh, we've got an earth elemental, which is a moderate threat. That's exactly what I wanted. Um, and so it it has the listed accuracy. It's got a minus two communication score. And I love the idea of it having a terrible communication score when it's trying to use this, this sack of Brilliant. to lure people in. And it's just not good at it, right? Frequently, yeah. when you have... Uh, when you have a monster like a doppelganger or a mimic that trying to pretend to be so, or even the, the old D and D wolf in sheep's clothing where it's gag is it's trying to pretend to look like something else. Uh, 
frequently the the whole point is that it's good at that and it will it will successfully surprise you and i actually really love the idea of a a perhaps damaged probe right a, a robot uh that has been sent from some star faring uh species and we have some you know creatures from outer space in in the bestiary um something that's landed and is damaged uh, and cannot be reasoned with and is trying to carry out its programming but the programming doesn't work well so we just don't assume that it's good at pretending to be a living thing. And we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So looking at the Earth Elemental, uh, it has a climb speed and a burrow speed. I like that. It's got a slam attack. We could obviously turn that into any kind of attack for the same amount of damage. Um, it doesn't, you know, if we say it's got a flamethrower and it's it's just a short one-yard flamethrower, plus four attack roll, 2d6 plus four damage, that, that really isn't any different than what it has. Um, it's got a series of favorite stunts. That's great for uh, flavor. Um, it says that they are blind, but they can detect motion by sensing vibrations in the ground. Uh, I actually really like that idea. And yes, it seems to have a big camera in front, but again, that could be damaged or that could be a, a vibration detector. Uh, and they got stone form. Due to their rocky nature, Earth Elementals have a natural armor rating of eight. So that gives us that base creature just great. Um, then you say, well, what about the big long tail? Well, there are a couple things we can do about that big long tail. Uh, there are spear fighting techniques uh, in the core rule book. Um, there are spear specializations that you can take that give you some ranged options. So if we want it to have this big long tail that it can stab people with at additional range, we can just look through the <clears throat> talents and there's pull weapon style. Uh, and it's got as the novice ability, you can treat enemies up to four yards away as if they were adjacent to you. So that gives you that reach we wanted. Uh -huh. uh, and journeyman level, once prepared, you are hard to move. You can set yourself an activate action until the end of the encounter. Any opponent that attempts to use skirmish on you uh, must first make an opposed attack roll. And it's got a whole bunch of those legs. So both of those abilities, they're, they're already here in the book. We've got them. Uh, we don't have to make stuff up from scratch. And I think that uh, gives us a base ability, the, the Earth Elemental. It gives us that range tail. And then all we have to deal with is that horrific uh, parody of human life at the end of that tail. And I would honestly, for this creature, the way that is very obviously not something I would mistake for a real creature, um, I would as a GM just say, okay, uh, it has a parody of life you make it a, a target number of like seven for a perception test, a seeing perception check, uh, or even a hearing perception check. If you can hear the... the yeah, it'll be making flappy, noise for sure. Yeah, yeah. The, the horrific flappy noises it makes that aren't real. Um, and if you fail that really simple check, uh, you still don't think it's a human, but you like you mistake it for an undead, uh, or you think it might be a flesh golem. You'll never maybe think... maybe making weird person. baby noises or something. Exactly, oh, yeah. right. Uh, and if you make the check, you're aware that it is the hollow puppet of skin that has been horrifically <laughs> preserved uh, that is being dangled on the end of a big mechanical tendril. And I, I tell you, GMs frequently innately want their bad guys tricks to work, right? You're, you're taking the role of the villain. You want to emphasize with it. And I get that. But in this case, I personally think telling a group, yeah, you see it, you made your, your seeing a uh, test you can tell that there is a hollow suit of skin with veins and some weird tendrils coming off of it. Uh, and, and it's wiggling back and forth like a sack of wet flour. And it has <laughs> long black greasy locks. And it has a big plastered on grin on his face that maybe is actually being held on by little metal hooks. Yes, and I thought about that, yeah. Something is shoved up through the spinal column of this wet sack of roughly humanoid <laughs> shape and shoved up in the head like a puppet and it's wiggling and it's making weird noises and it's gurgling. I actually think you will have more role-playing fun describing how terribly, terribly bad this thing is at pretending to be human. And player characters like to poke things, right? They poke dead bodies with a stick. It's one of the things that players do. So if they can't actually see what's back there, if the rock and the foliage, uh, maybe you even actually give it a focus on stealth that an earth elemental doesn't have. You can do that. Um, 
and say, look, it's it's got this hard cover. So as long as it's that position, all you can see is that there's sort of a metal tendril and something flopping around. And it seems to be trying to get your attention. Uh, people will either just attack it, in which case you have a fight, great. Um, although that is sort of the murder hobo road, right? I don't know what it is, so I shoot it. Or they'll yeah. approach it and try and examine it. And if then it leaps out because its primary programming is to try and communicate, which it's terrible at, so it won't it won't succeed. And then it needs a new meat suit, right? So player right. characters are automatically appealing for it. And then later, after they defeat it, if you want to give it some loot, you can find, you know, it's got a little abattoir where it's it's got uh, a couple of skinned people and the stuff they had is piled up in the background because all it needed was to flince the flesh off of them. And that allowed it to get that that really ineffective but disturbing flapping pantomime of life uh and that is how i would stat that up wow owen you you know so it clearly is a very obvious kind of piece and i, I originally just kind of started out with this sort of weird spider and then i added the big eye and i was like oh no this is like some maybe this is some kind of mech some kind of something we'll see put it you know kind of put it together and and then uh and then i came i thought about edgar and the Edgar suit uh-huh. from, um, you know, from the um, uh, Men yeah. in Black. And then I thought, well, how hilarious would it be as an adventurer to come across something that is so painfully badly done? Yeah. The almost pity, but then also so creepy that you're like, okay, wait, I don't know. Do I pity or am I you know, creeped out and dependent upon the sort of the, the skills and abilities of the party and, you know, and I, I tried to make this really sort of feel very, there's like kind of themes of duplicity through all of this. You got the, you know, the the kind of the spider mech there kind of hiding behind and kind of looking over the little bit of grass in the hopes to see how you'll react to the skin suit, which also, which is hiding kind of this, it's, it's a chicken foot is what that is. <laughs> but I just sort of put it in there, but it's a chicken foot behind his, you know, behind its back. And, uh, and then with that just dopey grin like hi and i thought what noises could it make and depending upon how people reacted you could have a lot of fun with that as a gm absolutely i totally think you can someone said it reminds me of glenn danzig for some reason um, <laughs> you know that is hilarious i thought the same thing i'm like okay sorry glenn uh, i kind of did a did a number on you holy smokes you do not disappoint sir that was i i can't i mean it it is it is a testament to I, you know, I knew that this would be uh, a fun endeavor, and that uh, and that you would be able to make something out of this. Whoa, wow, that was too much. Something maybe, but <laughs> I, it it begs for a challenge, and and I feel like this was sort of like a a buffet of of you know I I, I think about how to make this difficult, and I don't want to make it difficult in the way of like here's white just the white you know picture makes up you could actually probably master that with with uh with ease but i'm putting out the call if you can put together uh folks who are, are watching and listening if you could put together a creature of some kind and i will accept it in any form or fashion that you want to uh deliver you can uh do as i did which put together a a, a very disturbing collage uh uh, of which a t-shirt idea came out, which was hollow skin suit. Oh, we'll have to play the tape back, but it was good. And I'm just going to get a t-shirt. It's going to say, I am just a hollow skin suit. Um, but puts, you know, put some, you know, pen to paper, uh, draw something out, uh, you know, put uh, a, and again, it doesn't have to be as artful and as amazing as the piece that I put together. <laughs> But um, but let's see. I want to see us really push Owen to the point where he's like, we've invented a whole new you know thing. I, I don't know what happens. Maybe Owen splits in two, and then there are two Owens or something. That wouldn't be bad. One of them will be a flapping meat suit. <laughs> yes, a hollow flapping meat suit. A friendly one. He just wants a huggy. Well, it's smiling, so it, it, it could be friendly. That is true. That is very, very true. You know, um, interestingly enough, uh, speaking of all this sort of fun extra content that we're putting out into the world, and 
folks, if you'd like to get your own personal copy of this, um, I could uh, sign it digitally and ship it off to you. You can print it out and frame it, put it up on your wall. Uh, maybe we can get you to sign it too, Owen. It'll just be this. It'll be a beautiful. It'll be our baby. Uh, this has inevitably and reasonably led uh, Derek uh, Landwehr to ask a very reasonable question. Are there any plans for a Fantasy Age Bestiary 2? Um, <laughs> uh, there's certainly nothing announced, uh, and I wouldn't expect to see it soon. Um, with 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 the way that the, the gaming publishing industry is right now, I don't want to promise anything soon. Uh, but certainly, uh, I have interest in doing another book of threats and monsters. I don't know if it would be a classic bestiary, um, but I do feel like uh, there's room to give people some more advice on how to make a monster. Uh, obviously, I, that's something that I enjoy doing. Um, so I would expect us to be taking a, a, a run at something like that at some point, but probably not in the next year, for example. Uh, and then after that, my crystal ball gets fuzzy. So plans is a strong word, um, but there are intentions that I am interested in. And, uh, you know, these series are popular. Um, players buy them so that they know why there is a, a grinning parody uh, hollow balloon of a man lurking from behind a, a rock and GMs uh, buy them so that they can throw things at players. So that's... I thought like you are describing me. Um, but uh, Jason Sunday brings something up. Uh, maybe this is a, a little bit closer in the range of your crystal ball. In Fantasy Age, I've had issues with the combination of high hit points and heavy armor when trying to damage warriors. When the warrior gets damaged, they only take a point or two at a time, if that. Uh, Blue Rose in Modern Age gives heavy armor lower armor rating than Dragon Age or Fantasy Age. Will this be addressed in future products? Uh, it's certainly something I'm looking at. Um, the main issue that I, I tend to have uh, with Fantasy Age Combat is there comes a point where it tends to drag on a bit. And this is a, a known issue. Um, and there are lots of potential ways to fix that. I don't want to take the benefits of heavy armor away from warriors because, you know, mages can cast spells uh, and rogues get a whole bunch of neat tips and tricks and, and things they can pull off. And warriors really kind of have heavy armor as, as one of their balancing factors, one of the things that makes them worthwhile and cool to play. Uh, but I absolutely think it's, it's worth investigating how that is coming about and how we can prevent it from uh, reducing fun instead of increasing fun. So it's on my radar. Um, I don't have a set solution for it yet, but it is absolutely something that, that we are aware of as a potential issue with some groups. Uh, and thinking about things that we can potentially fix the problems for those people that have problems. Absolutely. So if you do, if you are sitting on an idea for a creature or a monster, don't send it to Owen because we want it to be a surprise. Send it to Let's Play at GreenRonin.com, and uh, you know, send again. It could be in any medium that you could, I don't know, either take a picture of or digitize in some fashion. Get it over to us, and we will uh, we'll sort through them and uh, we'll we'll share. And you know, in the meantime. You know, you've got my mind, so I'm happy to. Uh, a, a, I'll give you a flood of creatures, uh, for sure. Uh, yep, Jason says another advanced piece here would be cool. And um, you know, one of the things too that I wanted to pivot to real quick before we uh, skittered away to our um, flensing circle, when you um, we were uh, Crystal and uh, Steve and I were doing our Mutants and Masterminds Monday, we talked about, hey, if you wanted a Patreon, if you wanted some, if you had ideas of things you wanted to embrace or things you would like to see, and I'm speaking to you as the uh, the people watching, uh, what, what makes a Patreon interesting? What do you, what do you want to see? What do you expect to find? What do you what are some creative things that you were like, I wish people would have done that? Uh, I'm curious to hear some ideas from folks. Uh, Jason says, that's great. My players will be happy to hear that. Everyone is jealous of the warrior because they barely get hurt. Uh, yeah. So you have a question for you about that. You know, when I think about that piece, if I, I wonder if there's a game mechanism that doesn't quite jive with the gaming culture of a particular, like house rules. Couldn't you shift or change those rules a bit to suit the party or 
is that a is that a thing people don't do specific to fantasy age? Well, I mean, I think I think for any role playing game, there are people that are going to have house rules, um, and uh, I think a lot of game designers uh, start as people who do house rules. Um, yeah. I, I, I was actually literally doing game design on RPGs before I ever played an RPG. Um, I, I think any house rule that everyone in the group is happy with and that you're all willing to consider adjusting if it turns out it doesn't do what you want it to uh, is worth trying out. Gotcha. That's great. Do you, um, do you have a favorite house rule or a favorite kind of thing that you do both either as a player or as somebody who's, uh, who's being the GM? Um, almost all of my groups uh, as we play have adopted part of a concept from D&D 4th edition. And I know people, a lot of people don't like D&D 4th edition, but I'm talking about a specific thing that we drew from it because we found it so useful. And that is the concept of someone being bloodied. That is kind of regardless of what role-playing game we're playing. We say, look, you can tell if someone is uninjured, right? They're fresh, they haven't taken any damage, that's obvious. Um, you can tell if they're injured, but not yet bloodied. They have not yet taken half their hit point damage. Once someone's bloodied, they've taken at least half their total health uh, hit point stamina, or whatever you call it. Um, that's obvious. That does not require a, a special perception check. When someone's that beaten up, you can just tell. And that has saved us from constant. We got a lot of tactical players and they frequently want to focus damage because they would rather have one downed opponent than three injured ones. And so it was frequently uh, game time would get eaten up by people saying, okay, how damaged does he look? How damaged does he look? How damaged does he look? And they're like, what well, do we have to make a perception check? Do we have to do a, a seeing perception test? Do you get a bonus if, if you've got uh, healing? And with, uh, with the bloodied condition, we just say he's uninjured, he's injured, he's bloodied, and that's all you get without taking time to make a perception check. And that streamline our games and it's very simple terminology and we can apply it to, a, I mean, our, our Pathfinder games, our Fantasy Age games, our 5e games. Um, we don't use it in Mutants and Masterminds because their health mechanic is a little different, but you could, right? You've, you've got bruised and, and staggered and all things. You could pick a point at which, you know, if you've got five bruises on you, you count as bloody, there'd be a way to do it. Uh, yeah. That is that is just one of our, our as a group, different GMs, different game systems, we all have really enjoyed adapting that as a quick and easy information mechanic. You know, and after all, a bruise is just bloody inside. Well, and then sometimes we get cute with it, right? So if it's like, uh, we've we've said, oh, it's a it's a undead, so instead of bloodied, it becomes tattered, right? Because it, it might well not have uh, blood in it, depending on what kind of undead it is. Or uh, plants can be wilted, or, but that's just us having fun with it, right? It's oh, I like that. Sort of like a murder of crows or yeah, a, exactly. you know, a wilting of, yeah, I like it. I like it. The constructs um, are, are dented. That's good. I like it. I like it. Um, so, Owen, uh, we have a, was the Patreon comment related to Phage, Eminem, or just Green Ronin in general? Well, I don't know. You tell me, Steve. Uh, like, so, and to give some some information, obviously we are thinking about patreon as a way to get certain kinds of information to our fan base um and uh if you've got thoughts regarding to fantasy age or regarding eminem or regarding green ronin in general those are all things we'd love to hear from absolutely and the the point being you know if there was a very specific you know is it is it a value to have an umbrella sort of it's it's green ronin and then the lines you know the, the various uh, product lines are underneath with you know offerings from all of them is that you know i i i tend to think and that could be totally wrong but i tend to think that there are people who are sort of they like their they like their thing and maybe they want to have the time spent in a patreon uh on their particular subject of, of uh, passion uh let's see just says can't wait to sonarcom 2022 so i could see owen casey stevens and my mother in norman oklahoma yeah so SoonerCon uh is a convention here in my hometown of norman oklahoma uh it's normally in the summer i presume uh it will not be happening in 2021 they haven't announced one way or the other but by 2022 i'm guessing we will be doing conventions again uh and chances are uh, since it's the local convention that i would be attending one way or the other 
Nice. Very nice. And now, is that where the wind comes sweeping down the plane or? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. There's, there's nothing between where I am sitting right now and the Arctic Circle except Nebraska and some barbed wire. <laughs> Bleak. Bleak. It, it's flat. It's, it's spectacular. Super Kansas flat, yeah. is. Kansas is flatter than a basketball. Uh, it's, been, it's been measured by scientists. Um, it's. Uh, have you seen um, uh, tornadoes? Oh, of course. Yeah, the, yeah. The National Severe Weather Laboratory is here in Norman, Oklahoma, and that is the case wow. for a reason. Um, wow. Not only, not only have I seen tornadoes, <clears throat> uh, back in 2013 or 2014, which uh, a tornado hit Norman, there was a severe thunderstorm going on, um, and we thought it had missed us, which is pretty common. And so we had two friends of ours from England, and we were going to go see a movie. Uh, and we're driving along towards Highway 9. People who live here in Norman will be aware of what I'm talking about. And we heard the tornado siren go off. Uh, and suddenly there were huge waves of, of rain and visibility was cut down to a couple of feet. Uh, and so we stopped and pulled over. And our friends from England were like, well, shouldn't, shouldn't, we, shouldn't we hurry up and, and get someplace? And we were like, no, when the tornado siren's going off. We're going to turn on the weather radio because we need to know where it is before we go driving through this rain. We won't see it. Right. Um, you drive right up we, into it. We turned on the weather radio and they said, oh, it's it's moving down Highway 9. It's currently over on, on 24th Street. And we're like, oh, well, we're on 24th Street. We're headed towards Highway 9. So we think we're going to turn around and go back to our house because that sounds safer than proceeding on. Uh, and in fact, we had been driving straight towards the and We were still a mile and a half away. And I think it was an F1 or an F2. Uh, but, you know, it would... When you know there's a tornado about, frequently they are rain wrapped, frequently there's dust and debris in the air, frequently it is raining so hard you can't see anything. So I've seen tornadoes, but I've also, and this is the much more frightening moment, not seen tornadoes. When you see a tornado, you, you, can, you can decide what action to take based on that information. When you don't see a tornado, but there's one around, that's when you need to gather more data quickly. That is something. It's like you are our own um, modern day, uh, you know, Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I think we must um, uh, depart. Oh, yeah. I want to thank everybody for your patience. Uh, oh, and thank you for your masterful job setting up. Did we decide what the name was? Oh, no, we didn't. Um, and you could call it any sort of thing. Uh, I think I would call it, uh, you know, that's a really good question. Um, my my first thought was to call it a puppet master, um, yeah, but of course yeah, yeah. there's a Heinlein book called Puppet Master with bad guys called puppet masters, and and uh, certain grognards might might see the difference. But also, it doesn't really master the puppetry. Um, uh, I I might just to bother Crystal Fraser, I might end up calling it a meat flapper. A meat flapper, evocative. Yeah. I think yeah. uh, a meat flapper. I like it. I like it a lot. Well. On behalf of Owen, myself, the disembodied voice of Troy, and our new pal, Meat Flapper, Meat Meat Flapper, he's your friend. Uh, I say to everyone, adieu. We will be here. Uh, you'll see us on Monday. We're going to do Mutants and Masterminds Monday, and then we'll be back with Thursday. And, you know, it'll all work like it's supposed to, right? Right, Owen? Right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, all my right. friend. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your week, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, folks.